Hi, Dr. Romano. It's me again. What you Hi. working on? I'm doing a mechanism problem that I like to share with my dad's study group. So come around. Okay. And I want you to tell me what the product of this reaction would be. Let's take a look at the conditions. First of all, I have a tertiary halide. Now, I hope you all see it's a tertiary halide. Why don't we first name this? This is called the bicyclo compound. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to put two dots on the two bridgehead carbons. And I'm going to call this first bridgehead number one. And I'm going to work myself back to the other bridgehead carbon by the longest path. So if you go this way or this way, they would both be equidistant. So this is good enough. This is four, five, six, and seven. So I would name this compound one iodo, and then I would write the word bicyclo brackets. I'll tell you what to put in the brackets in a second. Heptane because it's seven carbons. So we have a one iodo bicyclo heptane. Now, if you look at the number of carbons between the two bridgeheads, if you go this path, there's two carbons. If you go this path, there's two carbons. And if you go up through this path, there's one carbon. So I would simply write this as bicyclo or one iodo bicyclo two, two, one heptane where these numbers just tell you how many carbons are between the two bridgeheads. Now, in part B of this question, I want to know what mechanism is operating. Well, it's a tertiary halide, and it's a weak nucleophile. So usually, if something is a tertiary halide, and it's a weak nucleophile, what am I usually thinking of? The answer is, I'm thinking of SN1. But let's hold on. First of all, there's no E1 and there's no E2. Why not? If there was an elimination reaction, look what you would produce. You would produce a double bond at a bridgehead carbon. You never place a double bond at a bridgehead carbon in a small ring, unless that ring is over eight carbons, because you violated a rule called Brett's rule. So never place a double bond at a bridgehead carbon unless this ring is eight carbons or more. So there's no elimination here. How about an SN2? There's no SN2. Why not? There's no way in hell you're going to be able to do a backside attack. Look at the size of this molecule. There's no way I'm going to come in through the backside. So it's no SN2. Now, SN1. SN1 looks good because it's tertiary, you got good conditions. However, what would the carbocation look like in an SN2 reaction? Now, it looks great on paper, but as you can see, we have a problem. A carbocation is sp2 and it's trigonal planar, which means it's flat. There is no way in hell that this molecule is going to be flat. This is a rigid system. So the great Peter Sykes of Great Britain, I think he said it the best, the molecule would literally have to implode on itself to be able to flatten out. So because it's rigid, you're not going to be able to form a flat planar carbocation. And since the carbocation is not going to be able to form, that means there's going to be no reaction. So this is a molecule that's relatively inert. To any of these conditions, there would be no E1, no E2, no SN2, no SN1. That's a trick problem. Um, I hope that you have a good understanding. So usually tertiary on a polar product solvent would be an SN1. But this is an exception to a rule. There's no reaction because of these conditions that I met. You never want to violate Brett's rule. And you want to make sure you can form a nice planar carbocation. I hope that gives you a little bit of insight into a trick problem. I got it, Ramon, Dr. Romano. I followed you all the way. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.